the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary Mother, Mother of God, God. Pray, pray for us, for us sinners, sinners, sinners now, now at the hour of our death. Of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Brethren in Christ, laudato Jesus Christus. In secular. This is Timothy S. Flanders. This is the mean of Catholic. Today I'm joined by Armenian Catholic contributors, Kennedy Hall and Paleocrat, yeah. along with special guest Dave Hodges. How you doing, brother? How you doing, guys? Dave Hodges is a structural engineer by training and a musician by hobby. He composes music for voice, piano, and guitar, and has been playing, writing, and performing music in various capacities for 30 years. He is currently a reviewer for the Metal Observer, a website magazine that specializes in heavy metal, the heavy metal scene. He attain, attends St. Francis de Sales Roman Catholic Church with his wife and many children. So Dave uh, contacted us and wanted to provide a critique to uh, Kennedy and I's video on music and effeminacy. And uh, so we, we really wanted to hash this out. Um, if anybody has any critiques for anything we do on this show, we want to hear from you. We want to hash it out with you. Um, it's very important as Catholics that we do hash things out when we disagree uh, because there's a, a, a great lack of charity among brethren especially on the internet everybody's throwing uh all this hatred out of each other instead of actually sitting down with one another and hashing it out so that's what we intend to do tonight um send us your live comments send us your questions we'll hopefully we can respond to everybody but before we do that i wanted to mention um prayers for uh justin uh one of our patrons his son's second grade teacher was hospitalized tested positive for COVID 19. Keep him, uh, keep uh, his son's teacher in our prayers. Uh, also, Zoe also uh, w reminded us that we need to remember to pray for catechumens in this time. Uh, people who are joining the church with a great deal of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, if you are a catechumen, please contact us. If you're looking for a priest and you don't know who to turn to, your priest maybe is, I don't know if they're abandoning you or somebody. I don't know. We'll try to connect you with somebody. Uh, try to get you into the sacraments because especially right now we want uh, you catechumens to be cared for and welcomed in the church at this crazy time that we're dealing with. And lastly, I want to again, stress to pray for our priests. Uh, we will offer the, our father at the end of the show, especially for our priests in this difficult time as they're trying to do their best in this insane crisis. Um, but you may be quarantined and you may be listening to a lot of music. So we're going to talk about music tonight. So yeah. I want to first recap real quick. Um, the, the basic point of what Kennedy and I were talking about um, in our first video. And that was basically a critique of the modern music um, of the 20th century and beyond. Um, so I'm just going to provide some basic points there, and then I'm going to let Dave respond and, and clarify anything and kind of go from there, and, and then everybody can kind of say their piece, and we'll just go from there. So uh, point number one, music is a strong moral force for good or for evil, or maybe we could say for order or disorder, and this is the teaching of Plato, Aristotle, Boethius, Augustine, Thomas, Chrysostom, Nietzsche, Schopenhauer, Pieper, Scruton, Thoreau, as well as modern composers like Cyril Scott, or rockers like Jimi Hendrix, Doors, Rolling Stones, etc. That's point number one. Point number two is the traditional use of music in traditional cultures, which have a, an ordering according to natural law, uh, is uh, the use of music in the cultus, uh, like sacred chant of any kind, um, traditional folk music used for utropelia, um, just utropella, pelia meaning right recreation, um, or for war, the war drum. Um, so that's point number two. Those are the traditional uses for music. Um, point number three is where we get into the critique that we had, and that is basically that modern music from jazz to rock is disordered, which is following influences from uh, primitive or disordered music out of West African voodoo or other things like that where it is an emphasis on the backbeat, syncopated rhythms, uh, which are, we view as disordered, which provoke the passions in particular, whether that's the irascible appetite or the concupiscible appetite. Um, and my sources here are uh, modern authors like Deborah Davey, uh, Viral L. Bell, 
uh, Tame against Cyril Scott, James Miller, proponents and critics of modern music. Um, and so because of this disorder that happens as a, as, a, as a part of the nature of the music itself, so apart from any lyrical content, we're just setting aside that issue. Uh, we're just talking about the form of the music itself. Because of this disorder, they correlate with revolutions in social morals in the history of the 20th century. And that's so why that's why these different mu um, movements, whether it's jazz or rock and roll, correspond with revolutions among the youth in morals because of this disorder. And so the because of this, it creates this attachment to the pleasure that you get out of this music, which then retards your spiritual life because effeminacy is a reluctance to suffer because of an attachment to pleasure. So if you're attached to the pleasure that you get out of this music, you're going to have that effeminacy, which is the vice, which is going to retard your spiritual life. So um, the, the key point is that uh, the critics of the modern music and the proponents of modern music, they both agree that music is this revolutionary force in morals. And so that is the, the basics of the points that we were trying to make in the first video. Um, Dave, I believe you had some clarifying questions to first get that yeah. out. So, so this is the standard, you know, this is the position that was promulgated by, I guess, Bill Gothard was the big guy who was doing this in the latter half of the 20th century. I want to say it was the seventies, similar arguments. Um, and so my, my first question is if the statement is going to be made, Christians should not listen to these forms of music, the word should implies an entrance into moral theology. In other words, we're no longer talking about anything related to um, prudence. We're not talking about uh, this is a good idea. We're not talking about here's some observations I have. We're talking about morality. You should not do this or you should do this. So the word should is very clear there. Um, and if we're talking about morality, then we need to be, we need to tread a little more carefully. Now, if you want to say something like, hey, um, I would not go to the tavern every night if I were you. Okay, because that's just a good idea to avoid these kinds of places. Okay, and if that's just good wisdom you might give to your son, that's okay, and that might touch on morality, but it's not an actual moral statement. There's no church teaching that says you can't go to a tavern, right? We know this, right? Um, so, are we talking about morals? So, I'm going to quote to you a, a comment that you guys had on the last video, and I'll, I'll read it to you. And it says, um, "Oh, I might have hidden it." Well, actually, you said it already. You said it already. Music is, a, apart from lyrics, music is a positive force for evil and good. Okay? But this is important that I ask this question because are you saying that it's possible to arrange a series of notes or music or scales or rhythms in an evil way or a good way? And if it's possible to do this, then it doesn't matter what the person's intent is. You've actually made an evil melody or an evil composition, or an evil piece of music. That means that anyone who hears it, right, can be harmed by it. Now, you actually say in one of your comments, this is the one where you, you say right here, it is hard to put generalizations on the exact elements of modern music that makes it harmful in itself. Now, I'm guessing that you guys don't actually think that listening to um, whatever music you don't like, whether I don't think you can think it causes leprosy or multiple sclerosis or so we're actually talking about damage to something else. I'm assuming the soul, correct? Yes. Okay. So I'm only aware of one way as a Catholic that I can damage my soul. And the only way that I'm aware of that I can damage my soul is by committing a mortal or a venial sin. And by committing a mortal or venial sin, I take myself out of the state of grace and I put myself in a state of sin. Okay, and if it's a mortal sin, I'm, I'm, I'm dead to God. Is your assertion that it's possible to hear a melody or a piece of music or a composition that moves you from the state of grace into a state of sin? Uh, uh, love it. Okay, I mean, that's a great question. Um, the I would distinguish between the objective, um, the objective force of a musical form, which is either uh, is a grade between uh, pure disorder and chaos on the one hand and perfect order on the other hand. So there's an entire spectrum be in between okay. in terms of a form, objective form of music. Uh, 
and that's on the one hand. And so, and uh, the state of grace and, and goodness, truth, good, and beauty are all perfect order. Uh, and so there is, so that's an objective force that is then put on the listener and the listener can then respond subjectively. So within himself, he is then going to make a subjective response to what he receives from without. But do you actually uh, believe that music can be evil? Like someone can make a melody that would be an objectively evil melody. Yes. Okay. So would you be able to tell me if I were to give you, say, five notes, could you make me a satanic melody? And what would this look like? Because this is very important now. Because instead of talking about something that's a matter of prudence or anything like that, you're literally telling me I can make an evil melody. And I would like for someone to do that for me. I want to do someone for you. You have to play it because I don't want you to, you know, I don't want to go crazy. But I want you to tell me what notes those would be, how you would organize them, and then how I would recognize this. So that when I look at a composition, I can say, aha. Now, Timothy Flanders told me these five notes in this order and this rhythm is evil. And now I know how to recognize it because moral evil is recognizable and objective. So you need to be able to objectively tell me what this melody looks like or a composition or timing or whatever. And it's not enough to say, I think this is disordered. That's not helpful to me because just saying something is disordered doesn't make it disordered. You have to define what order is. And so if you're going to say this is an evil melody because it's disordered, well, you need to define what order is. What does order mean in music? Does order mean you can only use three chords? Because that's very orderly. I don't know of any composers, well, actually there are some composers who do that, but they're actually modern composers. Ancient composers like Palestrina use many chords. Um, but anyways, the point is, objectively give me something to work with. Tell me what this evil melody looks like so that I can recognize it. Uh, well, the what I'll do here to start to answer that question is... Um, <laughs> Oh, were you gonna, gonna say, somebody in the somebody in the comments section put something Caitlin I think she's making a suggestion actually it was one that I had on my list too is what about a tritone uh okay yeah so if, if a tritone is disordered what makes it disordered this is an excellent question because if the tritone is disordered then all music's bad but you know I want to hear the argument if it's disordered then tell me why it's disordered and tell me how I can recognize it and and etc. In other words, I want to, if a characteristic that makes the tritone disordered is that it causes a dissonance, okay, then if all dissonance is disordered and all disorder is evil and all evil makes is bad music, well, guys, you're not going to be listening to music forever, actually, ever again, because all music is going to have that in it. So I might say um, music is something you're supposed to take delight in. That's sort of what the platonic idea. Um, so I would say we need to define what we mean by saying that music can be evil. If I were going to say it, I would probably say something more like music, uh, can facilitate evil. Uh, okay. But, 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 but in the same way, I would say something like, uh, you know, food or various substances could facilitate an evil. Some it's like almost a guarantee right? Mm -hmm. Some, not so much. Some, not at all. Correct. Okay. okay. Now I would say, I, I was thinking about this earlier. I was thinking what, what other art form could I make in an, an analogous comparison? That's what I was thinking. So I was thinking about the movie, the passion of the Christ <clears throat> in which we actually see scenes that are the greatest of evil, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, killing God is the worst thing right. you could ever do. <laughs> it doesn't get much worse than that. Um, and also they're very gory. They're very hard to watch. They're very disturbing. Uh, but they are appropriate for the film mm -hmm. because uh, we are delighting in the truth when we watch that film. Mm -hmm. And the truth is evil in that like the, what happens truthfully to Christ is an right. evil act, right? So we don't delight in the evil, but we delight in the recounting of it truthfully right. with the best artistic representations that you could do with film. It's a great movie. However, I would say there was a movie, you guys know, remember the movie Saw? I never saw it. Uh, pun intended. Um, but I did. I was a buddy of mine showed me a part of it in high school, and uh, he he fast forward. He's like, "You got to watch this part," and he shows me the part where the guy starts cutting his leg off. And I was like, "Well, that's disgusting. I want to throw up." And I was like, "I don't know why you're laughing at this." Anyway, the point is, it was actually I think about that part. It, it was probably objectively less, or maybe approaching as gory as parts of the Passion of the Christ, but it was just it was just outwardly disturbing that because it was. The fact was is that that was used for somebody to delight 
in someone cutting off their leg because of some sadistic game or whatever. Okay. So um, if somebody were to say to me, I want to watch the passion of the Christ because I love watching Jesus be crucified. I'd be like, you're using what is an evil. You're delighting in the evil. Right. Where if somebody said to me, I want to watch passion of the Christ because uh, it helps me unite myself to the sorrows of whatever, 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 and makes me, you know, whatever for my sins. Fine. But even then, if somebody said, I wanted to watch the passion of the Christ every day, I would think that that's might be a disordered right. view of how, because it's, it would you get what I'm saying out here. So for example, with music, like, can, uh, I, can I finish your thought? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, for sure. Go ahead. You're saying. Well, the reason I love what you're saying is because that's exactly what I would say. The way you're talking about, it is not what goes into us that defiles us. I didn't hear an evil melody. Yes. And it put a hex on my soul. That doesn't happen. There's no evil melodies. You can choose how you respond. Right. And if someone says, well, I only want to listen to this evil sounding music because it makes me want to rage against the Christians. Okay. Well, yeah, or whatever, something bad. Or, yeah. or whatever, something bad. Yeah. I might also say, well, this music doesn't affect me that way. When I listen to this music, I think about one day the destruction of all the devils. Or I think about <laughs> the old days and when crusaders, you know, fought for the Holy Land. Or when I hear this, I think about the spiritual warfare I have to wage. In other words, it's not what comes in, it what's it's what comes out. And St. Paul's admonition to meditate on the true and the good and the beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. Well, Truth and goodness are easy for us to navigate. Beauty is much harder. Philosophers have struggled for thousands of years to define what is what is beauty, and they all come short because beauty is transcendent, right? No one can say that I've got a five-paragraph essay that describes the most beautiful woman in the world that has any comparison to actually seeing, you know, a beautiful woman in a beautiful dress. Yeah. There's no comparison to a well-written essay that describes her and the actual woman because right. beauty is transcendent. So beauty is not so much about the object itself it's not the minor chord that was played okay it's your response to it and so when jesus tells us or i'm sorry saint paul tells us think on these things whatever's of good report think on these things it's not about what goes in it's about how you perceive these things so you're telling me that someone can take an objectively accurate piece of art okay and i would say the passion of the christ is pretty accurate yeah. i wasn't there no one else was either but as far as we know from the gospel accounts, it's pretty accurate. And, the and we know it was gory. Yeah. yeah. And someone can take this and say, I like this for good. And someone can take this and say, I like it for evil. And so I'm merely saying, I can put on a jazz album. I can put on a heavy metal album. I can put on opera. I don't like to listen to opera because it's hideous to me. But I, I could theoretically put on an opera album and think positive thoughts about it. It's difficult, so I don't do it very often. But the point is, by your own words, if I find beauty in a piece of music that you find appalling, well, okay, I found beauty in it. And that's, I don't see why that's wrong. So Dave, is is music entirely 100% a subjective thing in terms of its value to you? Uh, that's, that's a much harder question. So I would say that our response to it's always subjective. My belief about the objectivity of music is that music can be discussed objectively. For instance, um, we can talk about genre, we can talk about cadence, we can talk about influence, we can talk about style, we can talk about rhythm, and we can talk about the components of it. But as soon as someone says, this is good, well, good for what? Or this is bad, bad for what? So uh, Kennedy made a really good analogy of some of substances. And this is a, a really a, a personal pet favorite, you know, analogy of mine, sugar, right? I was we're all fathers, we all have kids, okay? Yeah. We all have kids that probably if we weren't around, would figure out some way to have yeah. like cookies for breakfast, <laughs> cotton candy for lunch, and ice cream for dinner, right? And, and all of us know that sugar is bad. And when I say sugar is bad, I mean the teleological framework of food says that sugar is for, I mean, that food is for nourishment. So it's not a stretch for me to say. Generally uh, speaking, sugar's bad. Yeah, yeah, sugar's bad, okay. Does that mean when it's my son's 15th birthday, he can't have an ice cream cake? Well, no, have an ice cream cake. Have your friends over, have some sugar, and enjoy this little respite of what you have here. Um, it's not what goes in, it's what comes out. And so, but we can still say that sugar is objectively bad overall, um, but no one's gonna make a moral requirement that says Christians shall not touch sugar ever. Right. It's so, a matter of prudence. 
Right. And I would, I would say, so, okay, you're exactly, you're exactly right about uh, the analogy of sugar is a good analogy. Um, so let's use, uh, like, I'm trying to think of a, a, a type of music. Uh, I don't know. I, I used to listen to, I used to listen to a lot of rap growing up, a lot of rap. It was a beatboxer in the whole thing. It's a whole past life. Um, a lot of really irascible appetite stuff. And I'm not even talking about, um, I'm not even talking about just like the gross rap, but I mean, a lot of it that generally <clears throat> the words aren't offensive, but it was definitely getting you ready to punch somebody in the face, okay? <laughs> which was fun to listen to before a football game and was quite useful at the time. Mm -hmm. But I, I would argue that something would be wrong with me if I listened to it on my alarm clock in the morning, unless I was in like boot camp or something and I had to get up and do my push ups for the Navy guy. But I'm saying like, if I was just like, I'm going to study now and I'm going to sit down and listen to this music that makes my heart rate go up and makes me want to punch somebody. <laughs> so like, you know, so I mean, for sure, sugar isn't objectively evil all the way through, but if you drink a Coca-Cola for breakfast, there's a problem. Yeah. Um, so it's all, whether the thing is in, a, in and of itself all the way intrinsically evil, which would be the case for some music if the integral good is not recognized because the lyrics are disgusting, right? Right. But but, Again, but, we're, but we're not talking we're about... Not talk no, about no, no, you're right. Right. But like, you know, um, I don't know, I'm thinking of March the Valkyrie, right, by mm -hmm. Wagner, which I, I think I mistakenly said in the last thing that it was um, syncopatic. I don't think it is. I think I was mistaken with something else from... Wagner. But anyway, the point is, is that obviously it's an evil song. Like it wasn't made for Star Wars, but when they heard it, they're like, this is obviously for Darth Vader, but it makes sense in the piece, like as part of the movements of the, of the piece he was composing because he was playing with the emotions as all good composers would do, et cetera. Right. Right. But if I was listening to the March of the Valkyrie every morning, I don't know, that'd be just kind of weird. <laughs> like to wake up in the morning, I think I would be seeking you, some sort of maybe an effeminate person might benefit Someone who likes to sleep in and likes to have his blankets until nine or maybe, ten. Maybe, maybe, okay. maybe. Okay. I want to get. I want to. I want to. I want to cut you guys off for a second. I want to get Jeremiah. Um, give him the floor. Okay. Uh, Jeremiah, what do you make of all this? Well, first, uh, first, I want to say that as a backstory to this, right? I know Dave. Right, Dave played a an instrumental role, in fact, in my. Uh, converting from protestantism and i talked about Congratulations. i talked about the the uh, con my conversion story here on meaning of catholic it was the first conversation that i had on air with timothy uh, back in the olden days it feels like a long time ago now doesn't it right <laughs> years we, ago we, we've come a long <laughs> way buddy. we've Pretty come long. a long way and so but I, but i mentioned dave and actually i've got uh my goddaughter she's glaring me down that's my reminder behind me on the regular she was really young back then and it's on the regular to keep me uh, on track and, and listening to the right music. <laughs> Not really. Um, so, you know, but I'm, I'm the one that, uh, and this is just for sake of clarity for some of the people in the comment section uh, who were interested to hear what we had to say and what I had to say on this, that uh, I was the one that reached out to Dave. <laughs> and said, I said, hey, look, you're a, you're a musical guy, right? Uh, you have a vocabulary for music um, and a familiarity with composition that I don't have. I've been somebody who's been a DJ in my lifetime. I started out with rock and talk. That's how I started. I'd play, let's say 10 minutes worth of rock music. And then I would just go off on these like mini monologues and tell stories for five or 10 minutes and then play more music and then come back. And that started actually on a Christian station. So far as I'm aware, and I could be wrong, Anybody in the comments or watching this, uh, if you've got any kind of background on this, let me know. Tell me if I'm wrong. But so far as I'm aware, I, I may be the first person to play tooth and nail. Uh, it's a it's a uh, uh, a group that was making Christian punk rock music, Christian hardcore music, Christian metal and industrial music. I was the first person to play that Um on the airwaves on an AM station on a Christian completely dedicated to Christian music to play that. My dad may also be the first person to ever play adult contemporary Christian music as the official format um, for an AM station that was dedicated as a Christian station AM in the entire state of Michigan. So I have a, there's a history here with this. I've dealt with people uh, throughout my whole life who, who would hear the music that I played 
youth pastors, different evangelists, ministers, parents, you know, the, uh, the kind of people that really, 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 um, you know, hate anything to do with Harry Potter or stuff like that, that they would contact me and, and say, you know, look, I, I can no longer allow my kids to listen to your, your station because you're playing a band like Crimson Thorn and Crimson Thorn for people who don't know, I mean, it's just, just I can't even do it. And I, I used know? to think that, I used to think that it was uh, that it was some kind of effect on his voice. Oh no, I've met him in real life. That's his voice in real life. Okay. And what's amazing about that is that every single lyric is a Bible verse. It's actually quote direct the whole thing. Boom, 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 boom. So if you actually go, it's the gospel message. Every single song, there's nothing but a gospel message. Now people can say, well, I don't understand what he's saying. I know people who do. And I, I'm not saying I did. Okay. I'm not a big death metal guy. I've never been into that genre ever really in my life. Um, but I was into industrial music, alternative music. I play electric guitar. Okay. I have an Epiphone dot studio. I've got a Fender. So I play guitar. I sing. There's videos of me doing this <laughs> online and I'm not taking them down. Um, I wrote those songs. And so, you know, and not only that, but people familiar with my work, right? I come on this show. And I'm a contributor. I love I, this is kind of my very uniquely Catholic thing that I do because I talk about politics and parenting and other stuff on my own site. But anyone who goes and listens to my stuff, it starts out with a rap song. Like that's my theme song is a rap song. How dare you? <laughs> yeah, how dare me? And so but but here I am uh, peddling the good news, loving Jesus, um, loving the Catholic faith, trying my best to be an Orthodox Christian man. Dressing dapper, right? Hanging out with fellow fans of Chesterton and company. And so, like, you know, I was interested in this discussion, though, from somebody that was more than just an experience, right? That, that they had a, a, a comprehension beyond what I had on this linguistically uh, and the way that their framework is. Um, and so that's why that's why I reached out to Dave. And so... I'm interested to hear what, what he's got to say on this. And I agreed with him. We talked actually on the phone, right? So I'm kind of pulling the veil here, right? <laughs> Letting people know what was going on behind the scenes. But we talked, you know, we had, we had our, our conversations and stuff about this. And um, I'll, I guess I'll just say this. Let me say one more thing um, is that there have been times in my life when people talk, somebody in the comment section was saying, you know, well, if, if, uh, if this music is causing you, to to do x y or z you know if the music is causing you to dance in a way that's sexual um i think the causation thing because i mean I, I can listen to music for example um house music i can listen to that um and when i listen to house music in my house i'm not thinking or, or starting to gyrate my hips right <laughs> in my house now somebody else may be in an environment where they're drinking they go with the with the expectation and the desire to do sexual things where they're drinking. There's a bunch of boys and girls there, the lights and all of this stuff. But they can also do that to to classical forms of music where they're dancing with each other, where that was a way where you would get close. And that that arousal of touching and, and being close to one another and doing the dance. This is not something that was it's necessarily unique to to people doing booty jigging and stuff like that's just not the way that is and so i would say the question of cause and as the final uh, cherry kind of on top of that is to say if i go back in my life and i think of quite possibly the worst place in my spiritual life where i was it was in kind of the tail end of my being a set of a contest and uh, and when I was on my way out the door, just leaving God all the way. And for what it's worth, that may be one of the times of my life where I was most rabidly against music that was rock music and where I kind of took um, the position uh, that is being argued here. Right. That uh, those things lead to to bad places. It's the golden brick road to hell kind of thing. Um, and so. When I was listening to 
uh, uplifting music and, and music of the mind and stuff, I was finding myself in pretty bad places, a lot like the composers maybe that I was listening to, <laughs> that, that those men weren't necessarily upstanding men either, and that they were doing terrible things back in the day when they didn't have electric guitar. And so th they were still doing these terrible sexual sins and, and everything else. And so that would be my... That's my two cents or maybe three cents. If you guys let me go on for a little while. All right. All right. Um, well, I want to get, I think that we can all agree that there is, <clears throat> excuse me, there is a very strong subjective element. Uh, obviously, everybody responds according to their subjective temperament, their inclination, their will, their intellect, their passions. We all agree that somebody has a subjective experience. And we'll all, I mean, we should all agree that it is not what comes into you because that is uh, an, not an action of your will. You know, if something comes into you, if you just hear something, you cannot be sinning because you're not acting with your will. So we're all, I think we should all, we can all agree on that. Um, but can we agree that it's impossible to make an evil melody? I think um, <clears throat> evil is defined as against, I mean, I would define it as a privation of the good. And yeah, so... Yeah, yeah. But apart from a teleological framework for music, we can't have a discussion of good or bad. So what I want to know is, can you make a melody that is morally evil? Don't talk about the privation of good, because we haven't even established a teleological framework for the discussion yet. So let's talk about evil from a moral evil standpoint, not as in a natural evil or a privation of the ultimate good. Is it possible to compose a melody which is immoral? That's my question to you. And if you think it's possible, I'll give you $10,000 if you can do it. Okay. Well, even if I, uh, if I, I'll give you $10, yes. if well, you let me respond. Let me respond. So yes, I would say, yes, you can make an evil melody. And no. I would answer, uh, that. So I Jimi Hendrix, I'm going to answer with Jimi Hendrix. He says, quote, you can hypnotize people with the music. And when you get them to their weakest point, you can preach into the subconscious what you want to say. From Life, October 3rd, 1969. Uh, the movie industry is, to a large degree, predicated on the fact that emotions can be manipulated mm -hmm. of millions of people using music. Sure. And the use of music for the manipulation of the of the emotions to the point of an addiction and an hypnotism and an ecstatic bacchic uh, ordeal is an evil musical melody. No, you're talking about people doing evil things. You're talking about intentions. You're talking about people saying, I want to inflict harm on this person by doing this. I well, don't do you think they do it with a, something know. that's good? You think they, they use something good to to accomplish this evil? Yeah, like people. In spite of it. Well, no, put it this way: there's no, there's no such thing as an evil piece of iron. Okay, I can take a piece of iron and I can make a club out of it. I can even say I'm going to make this piece of iron just to kill people, and then I can kill someone with it, and then someone can come by afterwards and say, you know what? I'm going to take this hammer and I'm going to build a house with it because I want to use it for good. People have bad intents and bad desires of their heart, but it's impossible for someone to say I made an evil painting. These oils are evil. And this can right, let, let me evil. ask a question, Dave. Let me ask you a question. So the, the musicians, including classical composers, mm -hmm. who, who literally worship the devil, we know they worship right. the devil, right. they sought to be possessed, and then they created music from that. You're saying that music is sort of objectively good somehow. Absolutely. God made all the notes. God made all the scales. God made the beautiful interaction of the fifth with the dominant and the subdominant. All of these things come together by physics. This is a beautiful, natural arrangement. I'm telling you that if some guy comes out and says, I was in a demonic possession and I wrote down, you know, these words, are those words now evil? And if he wrote down the word the or another article or another adjective, we can never use those words because they're evil. Or is what's evil the ideas that he's putting down? Okay. Is the Titanic Bible an evil piece of paper? Really? No, no. Okay. okay. I get what you're saying, but... Uh... I'm trying to think. Okay, once for, no, a word like the letter T is not an evil uh, the guy was letter. It's not an evil letter, obviously. But we okay. But we, I think we need to be careful that we're not um, separating 
uh, like we, we're not separating too distinctly uh, basically the form, the substance, and the intent and all those things around it because music is an art form. It is an art form. Really? So, so even though, and, and partly maybe the problem too now is because music is mostly electronic, we listen to music out like music. What I mean is we have um, like things are recorded. We don't listen oh, to right, music yeah. live. Is, yeah, that's what I mean. Um, we don't listen to music in the setting as much anymore as the setting that it's made in. So, right. I mean, you know, I grew up, like I said, around all these rappers. And I'd go to these studios and stuff and you walk in and it's like a cloud of marijuana smoke. And I used to work at a rock bar called the Salt Lounge. And the salt was a reference to that stuff that comes from Colombia. Anyway, I was 18 and got a job as a bouncer because that was what you do, I guess, when you're an idiot. And um, it was, did you ever hear this, Dave, you might know this band. There was a band called Thine Eyes Bleed. Did you ever hear of them? No. Anyway, it was like, I didn't know what it was. I just got a job at a rock bar and uh, I, I would work the mosh pits and I'd have to pull the, uh, I was in the all ages shows and the drinking age in Canada is 19. So that means everyone gets drunk by the time they're 17. And anyway, <laughs> at an all ages show, that means 15 year olds are there and they're anyway. So they were climbing on the rafters. But I had to pull them off the rafters and the guys were on stage and they were like spitting on them and they were spitting back at them. It was a the whole thing in the mosh pit. It was disgusting. Okay. So that setting, I mean, sure. I could say that, uh, uh, the guy had to objectively use some nice chords to make something that was aesthetically pleasing. But at that moment, I'm not going to separate the guy from what he's playing, what he's saying and how they're acting. Cause that's, that was the whole gig. Like that was the reason right. they were doing it. Right. So yes, if we can break this down into like, we're going to dissect everything. Sure. The notes on the page, the clefts and everything, those things right. are not evil things. Just right. like, just like the letters in the satanic Bible on right. evil letters. But they are symbols for what the intent of the author or the intent of the author mm -hmm. and the intent of the artist. And I don't think we're being genuine if we separate those things uh, because in reality, they're not separated when we use them. Right. And so my response to that is, and that's, that's a good point, right? My response to that is that music is an abstract art form. In other words, music yeah. does not contain propositional truth. It is impossible to write the Bible in music and say, aha, I wrote the Bible to music. Of course. And now it's not, I have this music here, and here's the book of Genesis. It's 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 an hour and a half long with a 45 piece orchestra. That doesn't work. You can't do that. Music oh, is completely abstract. So if you're going to say that this thing was composed in an evil way, well, to what end? What, what, what was their what was their purpose? Maybe they wanted to use it for something bad. Maybe it's still good. You know. Maybe I still like it. Yeah, that could Maybe be true. All right. Someone could sacrifice a sweet potato to Odin. Right. And it still might taste really dank. Like I, I, I'm not going to say one way or the other. And a sweet potato still has nourishment to it. In other words, I'm not saying we have to spe separate everything out. But to your point, we, we do live in a world where we don't have to go to venues to listen to music. Uh -huh. That means I can listen to a Metallica CD and I don't actually have to be moshing. That's actually a good thing. Uh, we also have the benefit of being able to listen to 45 piece orchestras and we can be a peasant with Spotify account, right? 200 years ago, you wanted to hear a symphony, you were part of the nobility. You didn't just get to walk up and hear any of that music. We're privileged to have access to all this music that we can hear both basically for free. So times are different. We have a lot of things in our favor and a lot of things that are very different now. So we can separate some of these things. I can listen to, for instance, Wagner, and I don't have to entertain any of his silly racialist ideology, right? I can listen to Mozart. I don't have to entertain any of his terrible licentious affairs. Yeah. Um, I can listen to Beethoven and not have to entertain any of his, you know, strange humanistic ideas that he put in his Ninth Symphony. This is all possible because music is music. God gave it to us. And we should expect that as we get to a time period where information travels so quickly that music is going to change constantly and it's going to adopt different forms. And if you hear a piece of music that you don't like, it's okay. Not everyone has to like every piece of music. But to jump to, aha, this is disordered because it's different from this. I don't even think, and I think it is a really good statement you have here. Someone actually said, like, how do you tell whether music's good or bad? How do you tell whether it's disordered? And your answer was very candid. It's hard to put generalizations on the exact elements that make modern music harmful in itself. What yeah. you're basically saying is, we don't really actually know how to identify it, but we're pretty sure it's there. So Dave, would you, let me, let me cut in here, Dave. Yep. So 
would you agree that the church should place limits on the music that is used in the sacred liturgy? 100% yes. Why? Because tradition matters, and we don't just make up things in Mass. The Mass is per, was given to us and passed down by the apostles, okay? Um, for instance, there's a lot of things we don't do in Mass. We use candles still, right? Do we really need candles nowadays? No, we use them. I'm not for making any changes in something like the Mass. Um, I actually probably am more conservative than you are because I don't actually believe that polyphony should be used in the mass. Ooh. Um, right. Okay, okay. So there you go, getting deep. So, so, but why? Why are you saying it's just for the sake of tradition, or is there an element in the music itself that must be preserved because of that element in the music? I would say that at I would say that in general, when you're at a place where you're telling people to pray you're not giving anyone something that should be used for entertainment. And I believe that the, the Fair enough. There, are, there are multiple purposes for music. And we both recognize that the vast majority of music a thousand, 2000, 3000 years ago was, was religious in nature. You know, not everyone had instruments, right? Um, and the few people that did were often employed in sacred duties. And this is heathen and pagan alike, right? Yep. You had musicians assigned for, for temple duties. Um, and as time went on, you had there was a separation. So, you know, 2000 years ago, you had people with lutes or flutes or whatever, and they could get together and they could have music. There was folk music entertaining. It's part of what they want to do. And I would say that it, the church was right to say, no, we're not going to have instruments in this. And the early church said no instruments because instruments were associated with folk gatherings. And that was not what mass was for. Mass is not a folk gathering, despite what the Novus Ordo Bishop will tell you. It is actually a sacred sacrifice. So to limit religious music to religious music, I have no problem with that. But I do have a problem with someone saying, well, I wouldn't listen to this in mass, so therefore no one can listen to it ever. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of things I don't do in mass. but Well, and I, I wanted to say something, kind of playing off of this. Somebody in the, in the comment section, I think it's uh, Una Fide, uh, was saying that you can't mosh to chant. And I was saying, but, and I, I thought right away, I thought, well, but you can't have horror movies with the... Uh, uh, Dia Ire, right? I mean, uh, uh, The Shining. Anybody? <laughs> like, it begins with chant. It's the most. It's the most. What is it? The most frequent series of notes that's in any horror movie ever made is from chant. Can you pray to that? Can that be part of the liturgy? And if so, that's a weird. That's at least. That's at least some kind of anomaly. That's something weird going on where you can have something good and yet it can be used for things that maybe a lot of people watching this might say, well, that's just bad stuff. That's evil or even satanic. Um, and yet it very comfortably finds its home there where that's in fact, where it's most known, more people would recognize it from that than from funeral masses anymore. You know? So, I mean, it's something to think well, about, I, would, I guess. It reminds us of death, which makes sense for a, for a movie about murdering people. I, sure. they, 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 yeah. There's still a bigger point to be made, though, and I'm going to keep coming back to this because I think it's the most beautiful thing you've said tonight, and that is that you can watch The Passion of the Christ and be moved by the sacrifice, and someone else can do the same thing with evil intent. And um, I am constantly reminded by our Lord's refrain in the New Testament. <laughs> he says this more than anything else. He says, be not afraid. Don't be afraid. Fear not. It's a very constant refrain. And... Uh, I wonder to myself, does this mean that um, that we're never allowed to be attacked by bears? Because I would be afraid if I were attacked by bears. Is Jesus saying never be attacked by a bear? No. He is saying do not let your thoughts be dominated by fear, right? So the statement is not so much never be in a position where something bad can happen to you. And the position is actually make the disposition of your life Christ-centered. So when Paul says, for instance, Whatever is true, good, and beautiful, whatever is of good report, think on these things. Don't fill your mind with things that are negative, right? So if, if you have someone who listens to dark, depressing music, and they do it to feed a dark, depressing appetite, yeah, that's a problem. And I agree with you guys. Okay, but so, I mean, in, 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 but you said, but you, this is interesting, and I want to get your thoughts on this. Sure. So you, you've said, you just said dark, depressing music. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're 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 saying essentially that there is definitely an arrangement of music that evokes dark and depressing emotions in the person just 
by the way that it's put forth? Well, I would say that there's some music that some people find depressing and they listen to it for that reason. Um, so for no, I know, but let's, let's use another analogy. So uh, do you guys know uh, David Galanter? He's a professor. I think that's his name. He's a professor at um, one of the, either MIT or Yale. Anyway, he came out, he's, he's come out against evolution actually, but he's not a Catholic. He's like a secular Jew. But one of the reasons is because he started to see objective beauty. That's what he said. And he said, listen, I can't prove 100% that something beautiful 100% of the time, but he was traveling Europe and things like this over the years. And he realized that there was something about the fact that everybody on earth would go see the Sistine Chapel or everybody on earth would go see these things in Rome, even if they weren't Catholic and everyone went, wow, that's the most beautiful thing I think I've ever seen. Now there'd be the odd person who wouldn't, right? Um, but it was like 99%. And this guy's right. a math guy. He's a computer science guy. He's a big brain. Um, so he said to him, that was proof enough that there was something like objective beauty and that this was the closest approximation. Mm -hmm. So, you're, I, I see what you're saying that it's possible that we can subjectively take something away and we can use it for whatever. But I also think it's possible that some music is just the way that it's received most of the time or basically objectively in its actual reception by people mm -hmm. is dark and depressing. Right. So I think so. I agree that it's not like spiritual cooties. You turn it on and all of a sudden you're a depressed person. Right, <laughs> but at the same time, you know, a police officer uh, might have to—I don't know—he might have to like sit there and watch some weird child pornography to go through it as a detective or something right. like, like crazy. I'm thinking of the most insane thing. No, it's a great analogy. But the minute he starts to delight in it, right, and he would also have to greatly guard himself. Correct. From so, I, like, I know I don't. I'm not going to say once again. You touch it, you get devils. I'm not going to say that. Right. But I am going to say that perhaps we should proceed with caution and almost never like for some things it should be like I would never even go there. OK. And, mm -hmm. and, and listen, and listen that's, that's totally fair. But let, let's talk yeah. about this objective beauty thing. Suppose 99 percent of people think something's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Does that mean beauty is a popularity contest? No, 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 no. No, of course not. No. And I agree with you. I'm just no. saying 99 percent of people thinking something's beautiful. If objective beauty exists, it doesn't matter how many people like it. Of and course. Of course. People don't like it. Okay, but objective beauty we know actually doesn't exist, and that's okay. Um, no one actually believes in objective beauty. The church doesn't believe in objective beauty. If it did, we'd have all sorts of problems, right? Because if objective beauty exists, then that means objective ugliness exists, and the church is not going yeah. to publish a list and say, here are all the people that are objectively beautiful, and here are the people that are objectively ugly. And since the church teaches that we should only meditate on the truth, the good, and the beautiful— uh, Hilda, Sally, and Gertrude. Don't think about your aunt Hilda. <laughs> yeah. They will not be allowed to come to the singles meeting because they're objectively ugly and men should yeah. not face after them. No one's going to do this. No one believes any of this stuff, right? However, you, you've, you've brought about something that's a very interesting question, and that is, what about music that everyone seems to think is down and depressing? And I'm going to bring up an example of a group that no one's ever heard of. It's called Nijikata. It's okay. two men who uh, make very strange ambient black metal. Um and they, it's very long uh -huh. uh, pieces. Compositions are be vary between 15 and 45 minutes. Wow. Um, it's very uh, reverbed, very separated. Um, I listen to this band a lot I look when I'm working on drawings late at night. I listen to this band um, when I'm driving sometimes, since I'm thinking. Uh, to me, it's very contemplative music. It sounds very dark and depressing. My wife heard me listening to it one time and asked me seriously. She said, do you listen to this because you enjoy it? And I said, yeah, I do. I love this music. Um, and she said, why? And I said, well, this is the music. Okay. So just to give, give a little bit of backstory. Um, I buried my stillborn son last year and we had had eight perfect pregnancies and I had no reason to think that this one would be any different, but we went to the doctor and the doctors said, we're, we're sorry. Yeah. This one didn't make it. Yeah. Um, bear with me a second. Okay. So I processed this over the course of 48 hours. And the only thing I could find myself listening to that had any meaning was this Nijikata music, this black metal. It was very distant and reverbed. And what I liked about it was, was it was the spiritual equivalent to me of groanings before God with no actual petitions. What was I going to say? Bring my child back to life? You know, here I am. I've been stripped of, of, of a potential young one. Couldn't even, couldn't even like even for one day, just come out and see the world. And that was it. 
Um, and as I was listening to this music, it helped me process this grief. And my wife was genuinely like, what are you doing listening to this? This helps me. I was really able to find beauty in the fact that maybe there was some, some comfort in this point of solitude in my life. And so I come back to that a lot and I remember how important that was for me. Do I think that people should listen to this all the time? In fact, if I saw someone who said, I can't get through the day without eight hours of this music, I'd be like, oh, yeah. <laughs> we need to talk about what's going on in your life, right? Right. Proceed with caution, right? Proceed yes. with caution. Proceed with, and here's the virtue that I've been coming to the whole night, prudence. Prudence. That's what this is about. And if you're going to tell me that listening to Duke Ellington is making me participate in voodoo stuff, spiritual cooties. No, I'm not going to pay any attention, serious attention to that. But if you're going to say, hey, music affects your soul, man, pay attention to it. Be cognizant of what's happening. Hey, I'm right there with you guys, but I'm not going to make a rule. The same way I'm not going to make a rule about alcohol, right? You want to talk about something that elevates the baser passions, something that makes people go after sex and food and wrath and useless fights? Look no further than booze, right? But I don't know of any Catholics saying no Christian should ever drink alcohol. We do it every Sunday. That'd make, that'd make you a Baptist. That would make right. you yeah. a Baptist, right? Yeah. You it's know what? why Baptists wrong religion, man. So you know yeah. why Baptists don't yeah. like sex the way because it might lead to dancing. <laughs> mm. Go on, sorry. <laughs> well, Dave, thanks for sharing, brother. I you know, it's a terrible situation. You know, we all feel for you here. We're all fathers here. I can't imagine how I'd feel in that situation. So thanks for sharing that. Um, I want to just clarify one thing and then I want to have audience ask questions or comments um would you say that um you do not believe that there is such a thing as objective beauty i would say that if it exists it doesn't exist in any way that makes sense for us to talk about in other okay. words if objective beauty exists it exists on a realm that is transcendent to our understanding i think the best we can say because and the reason i think this is because um let's be real here beauty possesses depth OK, uh, meaning that you might hear a song that doesn't hit you for a while, but over repeated listens, you might really start to see a depth to it that you can't really explain um, the the attraction you have for your wife. Right. How, her virtues are going to play into how attractive you find her. So it's not just about how her face looks. Right. It, it's everything. It's your history. It's your past experience. So music also goes into this. Right. Where, where were you when you first heard this music? What were you doing? What was your what was your state in life? OK, this all this affects it. Right. You guys are talking about when I was a really bad person, I was into this music. I wouldn't listen to that stuff anymore either. Right now, I've been listening to heavy metal since I was a kid and I went through some bad times in my life, but it was never because of the heavy metal. Um, so objective beauty, I think, is something maybe we'll get a taste of in heaven. But right now, um, I think all we can do is say thank God for beautiful things and find beauty where we can and thank God for him. But beyond that. I would really hate it if some guy were to come up with a system of beauty and prove that my wife was objectively ugly or something like that. I, I, I would be pretty bummed, right? Well, my, my wife is the standard of beauty, and so you guys are all out of luck. But, <laughs> no, you took my joke. You know, the, but the thing is, like, uh, somebody in the comment section actually brought up the idea that, well, God is uh, objectively beautiful. He's the summation of all of that. And in, in that way, it's it's not entirely communicable because we're creatures. Right. And there's it's, like you said, it's transcendent to the point where we say, well, the idea we don't deny uh, uh, because because God doesn't have uh, uh, form like us, right? That He is spirit. Um, that we don't then say, well, there is no such thing as uh, physical beauty in proper form of the face, symmetry, and everything else. I mean, we we live in a world where that's just obviously not true. <laughs> right. Right. whether we like it or not whether we think it's uh, excessive or not or people are being obsessive and not or that it's being deformed or not whatever the idea that there is something that universally people generally recognize as being something beautiful physically uh the idea that that's something that's real to people um i think there's a point to that uh, and so i, I don't want to say that it's entirely subjective i think there's basic rules for it um, for what people would generally say is beautiful. And that's why we can say, fairly speaking, right, to quote the, the really great movie called Greek Goddess. If people haven't seen it, they really should. It's a blockbuster hit. But um, the, 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 the guy in there tells the actress, he says, look, you know, that's why you're beautiful on the inside and on the outside. 
And we can make that distinction with people and be generous and say that on the inside, the Bible focuses far more on the inside because the outside is passing. Um, and Good the call. inside is something that will go on forever. But that isn't to do to deny, you know, when you say, look, I say it this way, people say, you thought that girl was pretty. Well, yeah, I was born with two fully functioning eyeballs, man. Like I, I'm not, I'm not blind. Okay. Like I'm not going to sit there and go, I know, see you beautiful person. Th those people exist out there. It's real. It's in marketing. That's how it works. Um, and yeah. I would leave it at that. Yeah. And I, I'm a, I just want to add some comments here for, so Sean Morrissey says beauty is objectively known. The revolutionaries destroyed Christendom by attacking the idea of objective truth and beauty. And then Caitlin uh, adds, beauty should reflect the form of truth and good. Um, the definition of beauty is really beyond the scope of this show, but I, it's, I think it would be a great subject for a show. I definitely believe that there is an objective beauty and that there is, uh, I, for, to my knowledge, um, you know, St. Thomas discussing what beauty is, order, uh, reflecting nature, reflecting the creation of God. But it's I, I don't want to dwell too much on this. I want to get to some more of these questions. So CF Holing says, how are we to take the extolations? Sing ye to the Lord a new canticle. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like, uh, CF, you're getting at um, the just if, if we're talking kind of um, against some of the modern music, um, how are we to take this? I, obviously, the we sing in church. The the choir sings. The priest sings. Singing is is a natural uh, act of worship. I mean, I think we can all agree that we can take this verse as an uh, in the in the literal sense, as in singing, actually singing to the to the Lord. Um, I know that some fathers talk about the new canticle as the new creation, the the holiness of life, the virtue, and that type of thing, more of in a spiritual sense too, as well. Um, Anybody have any comments on that, just briefly? Well, I always understood the singing to the Lord a new canticle, not saying to make up a new form of music, but to, hey, he did it again. Let's sing another song to him. Like, we, right. we see his acts throughout history. He did it again. Sing him another song. Um, I, 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 I'm very wary of people taking psalmic texts and trying to get them to justify Whatever new forms of music. I think new forms of music develop organically. I don't think we need a Bible verse to, to do that. Yeah, uh, sure. new forms of carpentry and new forms of sculpting and all these other stuff. We'll just, but, you know, but not polyphony though. Right. No, polyphony is fine. I just don't think it belongs in the mass. All right, all right. I want to, I want to continue. Yeah. Right. I, I, Here yeah, we go. Speaking there of we Bethel, go. P.S. Aquinas <laughs> says, is modern Protestant <laughs> megachurch evangelical music evil or demonic? <laughs> First, you need to go watch <laughs> Jeremiah and I have a video called charismatic yeah, Catholics right. question mark. <laughs> um, and I think that, I mean, I think Kennedy and I would probably, break upon on the air and on the side of the evil i, I think I, I but i think we probably all agree that when you're using music whatever kind it is when you're using it to try to get an emotional high alone and that's your goal the problem mm -hmm. and that's what a lot of the protestant worship service is it's trying to stir up some sort of emotional high which and then say it's god <laughs> yeah say and then yeah. say it's god so you, yeah. you certainly and we even in the Gregorian chant, we certainly have emotions included, but we're not attempting to stimulate emotions alone. What well, uh, Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah, what do you want to say to that? <laughs> I'll let you go. Hey man, Bethel music's not bad. Yeah, <laughs> maybe a handful of songs, and I'm blaming Kennedy for this, man. Kennedy, <laughs> I had no idea what Bethel music was. Of all the guys in the group that did not know what this was, it was the one guy who's like kind of. The Lucy, Lucy 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 on the music, about, right? <laughs> and uh, and and so I went. I listened. I, I listened. To, what is it called? Revelation song. That's and, a nice uh, one. It's a fantastic song, man. Yeah. There's, there's a couple that are really, really good, you know. And uh, actually, there was another really great song. What's the one you sent to me there, Tim? I was talking to you and trying to get you to admit that you at least every once in a while break, man, and you, you listen to something contemporary. <laughs> well, I, I used and, to listen to Audrey Assad, but then yeah, she drank oh, yeah. the Kool-Aid. So. I, uh, I, I let you in on that, man. Yeah, I was yeah like, and she was. I did. Yeah, I, she, I, yeah, my opinion, making some good music, but uh, I want to, yeah. uh, Dave, I want to go to you with this one about heavy metal. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Dr. Jonathan says, can we be opening ourselves to demons by listening to a lot of heavy metal, Black Sabbath, etc.? What say you, Dave? Uh, well, again, I, I don't. I'm not superstitious. I'm a Roman Catholic, and by that, uh, I have to accept the Church's teaching that uh, there's nothing that goes into a man that defiles him. Um, Saint Paul actually goes further than this. Uh, he actually doubles down on our Lord's statement, and he says, um, 
He says, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the universe, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to regulations, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? Referring to things which perish as they are used, according to human precepts and, and doctrines. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting rigor of devotion and self-abasement and severity of the body, but they have no value in checking the indulgence of the flesh. In other words, all of the things that these guys are talking about, you know, the idea that a baptized Christian can hear a set of music and open himself, himself up to demonic activity, that's a frightening thought for a Catholic. Now, my understanding is a baptized person the devil has no control over, has no claim on. And to think that all you have to do is hear a set of organized sounds and suddenly, bam, spiritual cooties. By the way, I'm using that from now on. It's uh, a great quote. It's a great quote. I, you know, uh, Give me your royalties later. I know exactly. Spiritual cooties. They don't exist. They're not yeah. real. Now, I'm going to say something that, that also, because this prudence is a big deal here. If you used to practice occult behavior, and you listened to stuff like, um, you know, heavy metal and thrash metal and black metal, and you listened to that as a part of the lifestyle that you live in, attempt to glorify Satan, and you say, I am never going there again. More power to you. That's awesome. You know, we're all supposed to avoid near occasions of sin. The church doesn't define what a near occasion of sin is for each person, though. It just says you have to resolve not to go there anymore. So I'm not going to tell you that you have to listen to it. But, man, I've been listening to Sabbath since I was probably 16 years old. I don't have any demons. So if it's good, if it does cause that, it's really bad at it. Okay. I'm going to so, go ahead, Tim. Okay. I wanted to uh, follow up with another question about metal. Did you want to change the subject or continue? So I want to, I want to like compliment what, like, I want to uh, add go to ahead. what he's saying. Okay. So once again, no spiritual cooties, but um, I was listening to uh, one of the guys who works with Ripperger in his liber, liber Christum or whatever this organization is for helping people with spiritual deliverance and all that. And he was explaining how, uh, cause right now, like at Walmart and which is open and the churches aren't, but anyway, um, uh, the, um, they sell like occult images on their things. It's a whole thing going on right now and it's wacky. And, but the guy was explaining how it worked. He was like, once again, this t-shirt that you get for your child that has an occult symbol, that symbol isn't in and of itself something that has power it's not like once again you don't put it on and become possessed right it is possible for things to be um uh, it is possible for certain things to be hexed like in the in the cursed in the sense and that's why we get our houses blessed and there's various things that can like demons can demons can uh infest certain spaces and stuff and that's what the exorcists tell us whatever fine so it's possible i guess you go to record shop and get something that someone has done something to and it brings something into your house that just seems possible with the theology of how demons infest objects okay but he said the the, the biggest problem though is he used the analogy of like if you had a poster on your wall that uh, was designed uh, with sort of a, a demonic intent. So the, the point would be that by looking at it constantly or seeing it often, it would almost like soften up your psychological uh, – it would so soften up your psychology so that you'd be more receptive for when the attack comes, if that makes sense. Sure. So uh, – it seems to me, and by the way, even if I didn't know you listen to heavy metal, I would be able to tell just by the way that you speak with the intent, like when you have the intense sort of really, uh, what's the word? Like Jocko Willink, when he's telling something, he's like, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's amazing. But uh, <laughs> but uh, you know what I'm talking about. But, the point, talking. Is, but the point is, is like, yeah, okay. Someone who is rock solid, goes to church, prays a rosary, goes to confession, uh, you're obviously very intelligent in this in the sense that you can talk about these things in music you have a high level of intellect especially with your job that you do so you're able to look at things in a very almost surgical manner and you can sort of see them in a way for the pieces that they are and appreciate which is a high level of musical acumen which is a yeah. very different thing but then i would but but our culture and this is i think what tim and i were talking about in our one episode our culture is just so effeminate it's just like yeah it's, it's just terrible. so effeminate that it's like we shouldn't have any sugar Right. because right. everyone is losing all their teeth and has diabetes spiritually right. and sometimes physically. So right. I think that, so I would just add that to it. So, so that's a really, that's probably the, the, the best point you, you've, you've made tonight. Um, and that's something that I have to, to keep in mind that, that, like I said, I love heavy metal. I review heavy metal music. Um, 
I would say I listen to 20 new heavy metal albums a year, you know, trying to keep up with the scene and my writing for it and all that stuff. And, and it's, it's, it's a fun hobby, but yeah, if someone were to come to me, uh, without the same experience and maturity and all this stuff. Yeah. I have to agree, man. Maybe it's, it's no sugar for you. Right. Maybe it's, maybe, it, maybe it's take a step back. So my only, my only question then at this point would be, okay, so now we're back to the very, very first question I asked you guys, and, and, and I'm going to keep coming back to this, and not because I want you to answer it now, but I want you to think about it. I want you to tell me how to recognize what evil music sounds like, and I know, okay, no, no spiritual cooties, right, we, we agree that, but, yeah. but how to recognize this evil music, because here's the problem. Every time I've had someone tell me, well, this is evil because it's disordered. Well, what makes it disordered? Well, they used a tritone interval. Yeah, well, so did Palestrina. You think he's disordered? Okay, well, it uses a submediate minor. Yeah, well, so did every classical composer who lived too. That doesn't mean anything to me. Why is it disordered? Well, it uses dissonance. So does every other music. What are we looking at here? How can we tell this? And you have an entire, an entire video saying Christians should not listen to modern music, but yet the salient features that define modern music are never given. So it's like your field survival guides and you're telling guys, hey guys, avoid poisonous plants well how do we recognize them we're not sure but they're bad you guys it, it's yeah like, and, and in fairness i would say I, I do think we made it clear a couple times kind of like just the crap that's around right now generally speaking like just be careful turning on your radio that's, I think, and, I and think that's, that's, fair. A, that's a fair that's a totally fair thing to say but if anyone asks you how do we know like whether music is appetitive versus intellective like yep. these words don't actually mean anything. They're just made up words, right? We, we need to give someone something more to talk about. Yep. Is it the drum beat? You know, is it syncopation? I think both of those answers are total red herrings. They're totally false because percussion and syncopation don't have at least sugar. We can positively identify the bad effects. At least with sugar, we can positively identify what sugar is and what sugar isn't. If we're going to use the sugar analogy, we got to be able to identify what these things are and these loose kind of empty words like disorder and appetitive yeah, pick a song vienna by billy joel appetitive or not why not I know the song you know vienna okay piano man by billy joel appetitive or not well once again born 1988 this slow yeah. I'm, I'm trying to <laughs> yeah. okay right, yeah. you're, you're aging us man i, I, I will, will say look, i'm gonna cut there. in and just just kind of yeah. because i want to wrap it up and get a yep. final question in and i mean yeah. i would i would try to define like i said there's a grade i would put a grade between uh, the fully appetitive, um, and I would just basically my my proof for this would be the multi million dollar movie industry who knows mm -hmm. how to use these music this music to elicit in general a general emotion X or a general emotion Y from most of the populace, and right. that's how they make money. And so they're using the music, and the appetitive features in particular are an emphasis on rhythm over melody and harmony, and the backbeat syncopation which is the and the use of it according to the the uses of voodoo which was just hyping up that emotion so that you can have this emotional ecstatic experience and sort of get, getting hypnotized like Jimi hendrix is talking about i mean he knows what he's doing he's hypnotizing the people and that they're all getting it lsd than all four get, of us combined yeah, 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 yeah. we need to but, use them as a source but um well i, I i'm telling you that uh like, like I said in the beginning, the critics of the, the modern music and the proponents, they're both pointing out that this is creating an appetitive attachment in this general populace or this general demographic, which is creating a social revolution. And that, to me, is hard to deny that. But I wanted to get to this final question, yeah. um, and, and I'm sure you have much to dispute there, but I wanted to get to this. Una Fide says... St. Francis of Sales and many saints speak on the need to maintain and foster peace of soul. How does death metal foster peace of soul? And I think this is, this is to me, uh, subjectively what, uh, you know, cause I, I mean, I forgot to confess to y'all because I was also hip hopper, uh, metal and all that. I mean, I, I was into that as well. Um, and I don't have as many CDs as Dave, but I do have a few in the death metal category or whatever. Um, and, subjectively um when i started to apply this in my spiritual life and i know that i know that dave you what you said to this when we were emailing but um the the concept that god is 
heard in silence. Um, and that when you go to a monastery, you're not, they're not uh, pumping out a lot of music. There's a lot of silence. And, right. and so peace of soul, um, when we're consuming music at the, the amount that most people do today, they listen to music all day long. Right. Um, and so I guess, so to Dave, can you talk more about peace of soul, um, silence? Mm -hmm. Um, how do you interact with what Una Fides is saying here? So, um, first of all, peace of soul and silence are important. Um, I'm a low master guy myself. I find all of music intrinsically distracting. So I like the low mass. I like the silence. I need silence for prayer. A lot of people say that they like to have Gregorian chant in the background. I don't do well with that. I, I really do like the music. That's the problem. It, I really do enjoy hearing Gregorian chant and that's a distraction to me. So silence, I can agree, really is important for me. Um, I believe that it's important for lots of people. Um, I think that a lot of people also maybe live bustily loud lives out and about the intersections, the honking horns. And Gregorian chant to them kind of represents a silence, a respite right. from all of that. There's a quiet and there's peace and there's solitude and all of that. And if you can't get that in your life, you need to make it, right? Because meditation is one of the higher duties of man, right? To meditate on the things of God, to think about the divine. And I think silence is pretty much needed across the board with some few exceptions. So I definitely believe in fostering that. Now, how does death metal foster silence? Well, it doesn't, right? Being a father and having a bunch of kids with dirty diapers doesn't foster silence either, right? So we have to make silence for ourselves. Um, and death metal is not the how you do that. If death metal is how you're trying to foster silence, I can show you a few tips and tricks that are not death metal that will help you out because that's certainly not how you do it. Um, I don't listen to death metal anymore. Every now and again, I might listen to an album of it. Um, but there was a time when I did listen to death metal. Um, and I listened to it uh, very cerebrally. It was uh, enjoyable for me. Um, I found it exhilarating sometimes to, to work on projects with some death metal going. Um, but black metal I listen to a lot of, and I find it contemplative, um, and I find it cathartic. You know, there's a, there's a catharsis there. Um, I, you know, I have had problems in the past with drugs and alcohol. Um, finding black metal was a way for me to process a lot of emotion that I couldn't, I couldn't uh, crush anymore with drugs, right? Because that used to be how I medicated, was with drugs and alcohol. And black metal allowed me to assimilate these things without having to get high. Um, and there was a catharsis. So my wife can tell you the transformation I went from from my early 20s to where I am now. And so if I look at my effeminate self as a drug taker versus where I am now, I had the exact opposite approach from Timothy. And that's okay because people are subjective. We respond to things differently. So, so death metal itself... I don't see it as helping out fostering silence, um, but that's okay because like I said, we don't always get to have silence all the time. We need to make time for that. And yeah, listening to death metal 14 hours a day. Yeah. We might have other issues we need to talk about, you know, and I think that's I wanted to, true for a lot of people. I wanted to add here just, uh, I don't know if any of us have really dropped any, uh, dropped the mic on any scientific studies or anything, but I was going through this stuff earlier and I thought this was kind of a cool thing. It was a study from, what is it, Macquarie University Music Lab. It proved that death metal inspires joy rather than violence and misery. And they actually, it was a, a decade-long research experiment, Professor Bill Thompson, uh, who's been studying the emotional effects of various types of music. And the lead researcher, Yanan Sun, they gathered uh, death metal fans and non-death metal fans to listen to uh, death metal or pop while looking at unpleasant, violent images and to okay. see their response to it and how people would respond to that. And uh, I thought it was pretty funny that they either listened to Happy by Farrell Williams uh -huh. or Eaten by Swedish death metal masters Bloodbath. And <laughs> the results were, wh were that the uh, pop fans responded the same to this kind of imagery, uh, proving that death metal doesn't desensitize fans to actual real-world violence, that they were opposed to this, and that, in fact, it wasn't misery that it created in either group, but it was a sense of uh joy um happiness uh a sense even of empowerment and which may, maybe goes into the one thing i would want to say in all this when you guys are talking about effeminacy and it kind of goes back a long ways even in the even in the question and answer period here but that um when talking specifically about rap 
or death metal, the idea that there's a lot of effeminacy going on in those cultures is kind of cuckoo pants. Like that's a little bit absurd. Um, someone could make the argument maybe that uh, pop music um, is getting softer, right? But you still have this kind of um, masculinity involved in it. But in rap music, um, that's one of the main social societal criticisms of it you know it just is and and same thing with with your metal and and all of this you have kind of this old almost viking like attitude in this and where men are men and the ladies are are beautiful maidens and stuff and so like and mosh pits i mean i don't think mosh pits are very effeminate but mm. i've been in a number of them I don't I don't really I, it'd be kind of a tough sell. I think there's a lot of dudes who claim they're pretty masculine, but I think they'd be biting nails getting anywhere near one of them. buggers. And so I just it's I don't know. I, I it's something I would want to I'm over for on further I'm in another time. Yeah, yeah. I got a back to protect. Yeah, right. You know, but for another time. But it's just something I just want to throw out there that that, you know, the music that that I listen to. Um, and the music that I'm aware of and in, in the past and stuff, as I was kind of going back, I mean, I can see like Striper and Poison, you know, those kind of bands as being really effeminate. They also were garbage. I mean, people <laughs> hated them. <laughs> like they were, I mean, they were just bad. But at the same time as they were effeminate, they looked effeminate and stuff. They were also over, like way over the line with the ladies and kind of having... You know, uh, their their sin wouldn't have been that they were too effeminate, but maybe they were taken it a little too far in the other direction. Um, and so it's something maybe to think about. Um, I'd love to hear what people have to say, of course, the comment section. And, L and Let me get uh, I just want to get Kennedy, if you want to say anything uh, further at this point, and then we'll yeah. just wrap it up. <clears throat> um, mosh pits, just real quick. Put it this way. Uh, they hired they would hire football and rugby players to be the bouncers because uh, it seemed like the people that never went on the football team would be in the mosh pit. I'm not saying that that's always the case, but I'm just saying there was a lot of like 80 pounds soaking wet dudes with like the emo thing over the face spitting on each other and saying they were all hardcore, but they were like, you know, 80 pounds and <laughs> okay. Uh, and, but I would, okay. Okay. And then with rap raps, a huge rap in and of itself is it's hard to even pinpoint anymore. I mean, it's, 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 50,000 different genres. There is a couple types of, there was one type of rap that I actually think I would still listen to. Um, I know it's called stoop rap. I know you and Jeremiah, Jeremiah and I talked about this. Yeah, Basically, man. it's like, it's just usually kind of poetic spoken word, uh, not slam poetry, which is the death of art. But um, <laughs> but I'm just kidding. Oh, but, um, you know, but it's it's nice lyrical telling stories, usually kind of in a folksy way, like the Celtic Irish stuff where, you know, there's talking with over the the sort of the, the melodies with the banjos and stuff in the background but um the the beats are kind of very relaxed very melodic it's not trying to get you whatever now i would say though a lot of the rap that we would think is masculine i would say it's probably actually macho because it's really just inciting people to violence and to sleep with a bunch of women and stuff which you know that's kind of a false masculinity um were you gonna say something? Sorry. Effeminate. Yeah, oh, effeminate. Yeah. Right now, effeminate. Yeah. But uh, and I don't think all modern music is bad because uh, it's kind of like modern. I mean, I don't think all music made today is bad because not all music made today fits the mold of all the stuff that's made today. You can make a piece today that sounds like an ancient piece, and you you know whatever. Uh, the music that I like to listen to, though, like if people think that I only listen to classical and stuff, that's not true. I do like some country. Has like the folksy. Yeah. Folks, there's a song. This is some Florida Georgia Line and Tim McGraw. There's a song called "May We All," and I am not American, but when I hear that song, I want to put on the stars and stripes and I want to go drink Bush Light, you know, on somebody's yeah. pickup and just have a good time. And it's folksy. I mean, you could do it, but you could do it with a bunch of dudes and the banjos around a campfire, and it would fit anyway. But I re and I really love this group called Clan Andonia. They're uh, Scottish bagpipes and tribal drums. Mm -hmm. I think they're pretty cool. And um, but then again, if I were to listen to that a little too much uh, in the wrong context, I could see it. So not all music that's modern is bad. Music is kind of like sugar, like Dave said. Some of us should never touch sugar. Um, and maybe our culture needs a timeout from sugar in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. But there are soup. There are some people who have a handle on it. Mm -hmm. um, but I would as a caution, I would I would say 
if people don't have an ordered life, which most of us don't, we should try to avoid things that would foment more disorder in our lives, which could potentially be many forms of music. That's how I'll say it. A lot of things. And this is why yeah. the virtue of prudence is so important because, you know, we're, as Catholics, we bring the whole world into discussion, right? Right. We don't just say, well, we go to mass and we come home. No, man. What kind of computer are you using? What kind of music are you listening to? What are you driving? What do you do every day? How do you spend your evenings? Like right. this is all open. This is all open season for us to discuss and how it affects our lives. <clears throat> and it may be one of the few things that I agree with all Una in the comments section on is that uh, one of those things to be incorporated a little bit more, in fact, maybe a lot more, is just straight silence, mm -hmm. you know, to become become friends again with silence and not to feel that you need that constant background music, you know, that when you get in the car, you turn music on, when you wake up in the morning, music's on, when you're reading something, music's on, that you you really think about it. Uh, with your mind and with your heart um, and that you find the proper place for it, um, find out what it is to you and, and to use that silence to direct your mind uh, and your intention Godward, um, especially with children. I think it was a good point that was brought up. Oh yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. That, that's a great note to wrap up. Jeremiah. Thank you. I uh, want to thank Dave Hodges for coming on the show. Thanks yeah, so much thanks. for providing your counter uh, witness and examples and opinions. So appreciate that. Anybody else who wants to come on the show, critique anything we've said, we welcome your critique. We want to discuss with you and hash it out. So, so let's pray for uh, all the sick and the dying. Let's pray for priests, uh, catechumens, uh, that they may receive the sacraments very soon. Um, and be sure to check out, uh, support us on Patreon. Uh, also, Kennedy has a new series uh, at Being of Catholic on the new mass as well. Uh, so check that out. Also a uh, series on liberalism over at the Fatima Center. So yeah. that's also happening with Kennedy. So take a look at that. Um, but for now, let's pray. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as, as we forgive those who trespass against us. It is not the nation, but look at people in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.